prayer for illumination as we listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Creator God, in this world where goodness and evil continue to clash with each other, instill in us and in all your people discernment to see what is right, faith to believe in what is right, and courage to do what is right. Keep us aware of the subtlety of sin and preserve us, body, mind, and soul, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading for this morning comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. This book divides into three parts. A major shift of subject matter and motifs occur at chapter 40 in that book, and there's another sh shift at chapter 56. At chapter 40, the overall tone changes to one of hope and joy. This is supported by one of the new motifs, that is the assertion that Jerusalem has served her time and that there's going to be a glorious restoration of the people. Presumably this message, uh, this is a message that the exile in Babylon was about to end. And the end of the exile and a miraculous return back to Jerusalem would have been good news indeed. Linked to this is another motif, namely that God does new things. God can and will do the unexpected, the totally unpredictable, not in a negative sense, but in a positive, hopeful, and joyous way. God will act in ways that lie beyond human logical reasoning, beyond extrapolations from current circumstances. And God will do this out of love and care for God's people. God has a relationship, a covenant with Israel, and God is loyal to this covenant regardless of the behavior of the people. Our reading for this morning comes from chapter 55 of the book of Isaiah, the end of that particular block of material. Those two motifs I mentioned of a new thing and of the relationship sound loudly in the reading. God will pardon and restore Israel, giving the people extravagant prosperity, and God's way of reasoning is different from human ways. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and labour for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples and a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call all nations that you do not know and nations that you do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel for he has glorified you seek the Lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the, return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Before we move to the reading from the New Testament, I'd like to draw out some of the implications from the Isaiah reading while it's still fresh in your minds. 
We are in the season of Lent, those weeks leading up to Easter when we prepare ourselves to hear the good news of Easter. I suggested that over the weeks you take some time to reflect on some of the things you do without thinking, that is, behaviours and habits that are so ingrained they usually escape deliberate attention. I suggested reflecting on them and asking to what extent they embody the spirit of love and new life represented by Easter. And how might they be altered to do this more fully? Our reading from Isaiah falls directly into this process. Our prophet is in dialogue with common assumptions. Actually, it would be more accurate to say he opposes them. Take, for instance, the opening lines. If you have no money, no money, come and buy food. It seems that he's saying those things, the food and the water and so on, are free. Now, everybody knows that the world does not work this way. So how can the prophet say this? The opening lines of the reading introduced the readers, the listeners, to the idea of questioning the assumptions of their lives. The next lines are the meat of the prophecy. The rest of the chapters 40 to 55 make it clear that the people in exile assumed that God had abandoned them, that they and their forebears were so sinful that there was no hope that God would ever welcome them back. Our prophet says, on the contrary, this is exactly what God will do because of the covenant relationship between God and the people. God will restore Israel. In fact, more than this will happen. Other nations, not part of the covenant relationship, will join Israel. The strategy of the prophet is simple. Say something so amazing to get the people thinking about assumptions and then focus on the assumption that the prophet really wants the people to change. The last verses of our reading underline the need for rethinking. God looks at the world differently from the standard accepted way the exiles did. The implication is that the exiles should try to see the world the way God does. Of course, those verses say a lot more than this, and they say it quite beautifully, but that simple observation is enough for now. Our prophet's message dovetails with our Lenten reflection. The focus of the prophet is not so much on what we do, on our habits of action, but on the way we look at things, our habits of assumption and of reasoning. God's steadfast loyalty to the covenant relationship and his love for David foreshadow the story of Easter, which demonstrated God's love and relationship with the whole world through Jesus. All in all, we have a call to think again about those things we take for granted, our assumptions about how the world works, to think anew about them in the light of God's love for us and for the world. Let's move now to our reading from the New Testament, from the Gospel of St. Luke. In this case, I'm not going to present much of an introduction. The passage is pretty much freestanding. Jesus is teaching the crowds and responds to a question. The topic, however, is not so straightforward because the question raised is about whether human suffering is a punishment for bad behavior. The response of Jesus and the parable he tells are designed to cause his audience to question their assumptions about the source and purpose of suffering. After this reading, we'll have a hymn that, that, fo that picks up on the motif of God's loyalty to the relationship with us, which is present in the passage in Isaiah, and also picks up on the care of the gardener for the tree in our reading from Luke. At that time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, 
They were worse sinners than other Galileans. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. All those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on, fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for the fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that these human words may be the word of God for us this day, according to your promise, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all perish, just as they did. In fact, Luke tells us that Jesus said this twice in our reading. Our reading from the Gospel this morning confronts us immediately with what theologians call the problem of suffering. Why is there suffering in the world? Why do good people suffer? Why do random acts of loss and pain occur in the natural world? Every day our news makes us quite aware of these questions. The Royal Commission into Child Abuse continues with more and more examples coming to light. How is it that people can behave this way to, with children? And as for natural disasters, a week ago a cyclone devastated Fiji, destroying whole villages along with their food crops. And we'll be taking up a, a special collection for relief in Fiji during this service. Although they didn't have ABC News or Today Tonight, the crowd who spoke with Jesus that day in our reading was very aware of the presence of suffering. They referenced two examples. Now, the precise details of those two examples are lost in the midst of time. It's not hard to imagine likely scenarios. Those Galileans, maybe they were on the way to Jerusalem when they attracted the attention of some Roman soldiers. Perhaps the soldiers thought they might be terrorists. So they killed them along with their sacrificial animals. Now that type of news is something we're quite familiar with. Fear of terrorist or of attack prompting quite strong reactions from authorities. Happens a lot these days. And as for the Tower of Siloam, perhaps it was local, a lack of, lo of knowledge of soil conditions. Or perhaps shonky building. At any rate, 18 people died in that tragedy. Those deaths raise a question, the question for those who come to Jesus. Why did these people die? Actually, it's more likely that those who came to Jesus with the news already had their answers to this question. In those days, it was a common belief that misfortune struck a person because that person had sinned. A sort of balancing of the great cosmic scales of behavior and reward or punishment. Bad things happened to a person they would have thought because the person had done something bad. I said that in those days, but many people believe this simple explanation of suffering these days. When something happens to them, they ask, what have I done to deserve this? Or they identify a cause. My child has cancer because I smoke too much. I cheated on my spouse, so I, now I have diabetes. Deep inside they're thinking, God is punishing me for doing wrong. 
or if they're uncertain about uh, God, perhaps this is the way the universe responds to bad behavior. But it boils down to the same thing. I'm suffering because I have sinned. Of course, we know better, don't we? Suffering is not linked to bad behavior. God's justice does not work that way. Bad things happen to good people because bad things happen to all people. It's just part of living, of being human. At the end, God will wipe away every tear. Look at the butterfly. Look at the morning. Doesn't the beauty of the world count for all, more than all we might suffer? Doesn't the phone call from a friend, the word of comfort, show us that love, that care, overturns all pain? We might say those things. But Jesus doesn't say this. Jesus overturns the slick answer. Do you think that these people were worse sinners than you, he says? Unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. <laughs> this is one of those sayings that will make your head ache if you think too hard about it. Is Jesus really saying that those people who died were sinners and so it was appropriate for them to die? In that case, he'd be agreeing with the normal viewpoint. Yet the tone suggests the crowd has gotten something fundamentally wrong. And what might that be? Fortunately, before our head starts aching, Luke does not stop at that saying, but moves on to the parable. Jesus calls for repentance and then he tells a parable about a tree that bore no fruit. The owner wanted to destroy it, but the gardener pleaded that it be given another year and in that time receive special care. And in that parable we find a clue to what Jesus is getting at. The parable contrasts two sorts of people. There's the land owner, who is pretty much a black and white thinker, who judges on the basis of productivity, economic rationalist, and is clear that the non-productive tree must go. The landowner is sure of his position. The other person is the gardener. The gardener pleads for the tree. With some care, he says, the tree will work out well. The landowner is pretty much like the crowd who come to Jesus with the news of the Galileans and the tower. The crowd were looking at human life in terms of reward and punishment. Punishment is a sign that you've done wrong. And if you look at the world that way, then you are doomed to perish. Your spirit will be destroyed because no matter how well we try to live, we can never be perfect. The gardener, on the other hand, is like God. God as a gardener, the one who tends and cares and leads people towards a new world. The gardener is open to the possibility of the future. The gardener is prepared to work with the imperfect trees to break them more and more into the perfection they once they should have had. The contrast between the landowner and the gardener points the way to what Jesus means when he calls for people to repent. What does repentance mean? Sadly, the word is often misused. It has become something of a synecdoche for the worst of Christian proclamation, the sort of thing that is practiced by street preachers and hypocritical television evangelists. Did you like the way I worked in the technical term for a part standing for the whole there, synecdoche? Repentance does not mean crawling on your knees for a thousand miles. Repentance does not mean abject apologies for something you have done, though that may be part of it. Repentance is far broader than that. Repentance literally means changing your thinking, metamorphosing your mind. It means looking at the world in a different way, from a different perspective, and that is from God's perspective. Looking at the world through the eyes of the gardener. 
Repentance is shifting from being the landowner, from identifying with the landowner who looks only at the outputs, to identifying with the gardener, with God, who looks at the whole. With the gardener, there is hope. The gardener works with the plants, caring for them and helping them to grow and thrive. Hope. Hope starts from God. It looks into the past, sees the relationship with God stretching back in time, and sees that God is faithful and maintained that relationship despite what humans have done. That was part of the message of our prophet called Isaiah. Hope looks into the world and sees the creative hand of God which can operate beyond human capabilities. Hope looks to God and feels the mystery that cannot be controlled by humans, a creative mystery that formed the world in all its beauty and all its oddness, a creativity that exceeds human extrapolation. And then hope looks to the future and trusts that God will do something new. That shift to looking out with hope, that shift is that Jesus calls repentance, is a shift in perspective that may come when we examine our habits, our actions and our assumptions in the light of Easter. Or in other words, it's one aspect of what I suggested you do this Lent. What are those assumptions? For the crowd around Jesus, it was the linkage between misfortune and behavior. For me, for you, it may be something different. Maybe something to do with abilities or family relations or health or future security. Look at your assumptions, what you think, what you do and ask, how do they embody hope, the hope that was born at Easter? How do they express hope to you yourself? And how do they communicate to others that there is hope? That God is a God of life, that with God there is abundance of what we truly need, of what is good, of welcome, acceptance, and love. Amen.